can see from the handout that I passed out there, um, put a little extra time into uh, this lesson. I will put the handouts in the back, so for those that are live streaming, um, you could pick those up tomorrow at church, and uh, just left some space there for you to work with the translation uh, work and hopefully be a help to you. So um, I introduced our lesson on prepositions in the last class, uh, but I would just want to kind of pick up with what I was saying about the importance of understanding the prepositions, uh, because prepositions show relationship in a sentence. So um, whenever you think about grammar and you think about the relationship between words and the meanings of words, um, prepositions are very important because they, they add description, they add definitiveness, they show relationship uh, in the sentence, and, and then, of course, um, that helps us to understand relationship, the meaning of relationship in life, because we communicate through words. And if relationships are important in life, which I think we would say our relationship with God is important, our relationship with one another is important, um, then we can understand that understanding prepositions is going to be central to um, you know, getting the relationship aspect, not only of the grammar, but of life in general, uh, in, uh, correct. So with that being said, um, we're going to start off with the fundamental definitions and the fundamental meanings uh, of the prepositions. In other words, what I'm, I'm going to give you and what I really want you to work on and memorize the, these definitions, these are the most common definitions. These are the basic definitions. These are the ones that, you're, that you need to work and memorize and start with that. The reason why I say that is because as you build on your knowledge of the Koine Greek, you're going to find that there are nuances with these definitions, and there are certain situations and certain cases where that preposition is going to have a slightly different meaning than what it's normally translated as. But if we just start with all of the, um, you know, exceptions to the rule, then we're going to have chaos. So learn memorize the basics because the overwhelming time is uh, that preposition is used will be translated a certain way. And then we can begin to develop what are some of these cases where there's an exception to this rule? What are some of these cases where maybe a preposition um, in the New Testament is translated a little bit different or in a different way than our fundamental understanding of that, okay? And uh, along with that, I'll just say this, that um, there's, a, there's a big difference between that and just randomly mistranslating a word or, or saying, well, I think that preposition should be this in this case, if you understand what I'm saying uh, with that. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But this is this kind of stuff where if, if you don't have faith that God could preserve his word, then, you know, your understanding of the Bible is just going to be like alphabet soup, right? You just like dip in your spoon and <laughs> make a word out of whatever you want, really. So uh, you move away from a position of faith. There are, there are enough exceptions. And by the way, that's not just true about Greek. It, it's that way about English as well and, and so forth. There's enough exceptions to the rule. We laugh about learning. And when we learn English and we teach English grammar, especially to uh, uh, people that don't natively speak English and, and we're teaching them English and they're trying to get the rules down and you're trying to tell them like, okay, so, you know, every time in English it's said this way. And then you're like, yes, you know, but. There are exceptions to this rule. And then that just like throws them all, you know. Um, you know, it's like pretty soon we find out there are more exceptions to the rule than actually, <laughs> than, the, than there are examples of the rule. So um, let, let me give you some of the uh, prepositions and we'll get, we'll get started here, okay? When we memorize these prepositions, you, you need to re memorize them with the case. All right, so I give you these definitions, this vocab words. I'm going to give you the preposition, and I'm going to give you the case that they require their object to be in, and you want to memorize that vocab with the case, OK? 
okay? So, for instance, Apo. That that'll be our first one, Apo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you Apo with the genitive, okay? Apo or Apa, probably more correct. Apa with the genitive, okay? And you want to memorize that because that way you know means from. So you memorize this apa, 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 <laughs> with the genitive, means from, okay? Dia, with the genitive, means with. Dia, with the genitive, means with. Well, actually, sorry, I got that wrong. Dia with the genitive is through. I don't know why I put with. Erase that. Dia with the genitive means through. Okay. Dia with the accusative means on account of. Or we would say it more frequently, because. Ace with the accusative means into. N with the dative means in. Ek, and sometimes you'll see it with the uh, C, X, but ek with the genitive means out of. Couple more here. We're not going to give you all. We'll add more. Def we'll add more vocab as we go. Meta. Okay, with the genitive. Meta. Meta. With the genitive means with. With the accusative means after. And then if I can fit one more on here, pros with the accusative means to. So you'll notice that there's a couple of prepositions that have dual meanings or could have dual meanings, right? Meta and dia. Meta with the genitive means with. Meta with the accusative means after. Dia with the genitive means through. Dia with the accusative means because or on account of, okay? So those are a couple, and there's a few. There's a couple other prepositions that that have, um, or that can take um, different objects, and they have different uh, meanings. Then, okay, uh, apa uh, with the genitive means from, pros with the accusative means to, um, ace with the accusative means into, n with the dative means in, ek with the genitive means out of. Okay. Um, to give you 
a general understanding of how they use, how the prepositions in, uh, use case. This is just general. It's not general meaning, you know, there are enough examples of this to, to recognize a pattern, but it's not a rule, okay? But basically, prepositions um, in the Greek, all right, use case, genitive marks separation, okay? Dative is location um, or like a, a resting stative, a static type of position, okay? And the accusative Okay, marks a moving towards. So kind of trying to show relationship between words and, and what is happening. Um, this is a general idea of how they use the case. Again, I say general because it's not... A rule, because it's not in every situation can you see this type of relationship between words in the prepositions, but it's there enough for us to acknowledge that, you know, there's a general understanding of that. Okay? Um, you know, because of this, our sen now that we know this and we can add this in, our sentences are going to greatly expand uh, what we can say, what we can mean, what we can understand, because we can throw prepositional phrases in there now. So now we can be more specific. And, and, uh, but it's also going to be a little trickier because, you know, you've been familiar with words in the genitive case and the accusative case being a certain way, but now we're throwing in the fact that they c those nouns can be, can be objects of prepositions. So if you're not careful, you'll see an accusative case, and you'll be like, ha, ah, direct object. Make sure, you know, that you look to make sure that it's not a, uh, an object of a preposition, okay? As a general rule, I kind of like to put brackets around my prepositions uh, when, I, when I translate, right? So I just put, like, some parentheses around it. So that way I know, okay, that's my prepositional phrase. I'm not going to dip into there for my direct object or my indirect object or uh, what what have you, and, and I can deal with just that prepositional phrase. You're also going to have adjectives within those prepositional phrases, and those adjectives are going to agree with those nouns in person, number, and case. So you have to be careful as you're dealing with sentences, once again, to make sure that you get your adjectives in the right order and in the right place, describing the right words. Um, and understanding that those adjectives are uh, going to be attached to the nouns that they modify, okay? Um, uh, one other note here from Lesson 7 is nouns, uh, masculine nouns in the first declension, okay? There are two in particular uh, that I want to talk about, and when, we, when you learn these, they're going to give them to you. They're going to they're gonna give you the, the masculine article. They take the masculine article, but they decline uh, in the first declension. There's two that we're going to learn. There's prophetes, ha prophetes. Anybody know what that means? Prophet. It's actually prophet. Okay. It's masculine. Now it's going to decline. In the first declension, the way you think it would decline with one exception, the genitive singular, okay? The genitive singular is going to be the oo ending, which is the sec that is the, the masculine genitive singular. So, prophetes is going to be nominative, prophetu 
it's going to be genitive singular. Then it's going to go back to prophete for dative, prophetain for accusative. And then it's in the plural of that, it's going to take the first declension endings. I own ice os. Okay? So it's going to decline with first declension endings with the exception of the genitive singular. It's going to be this u. Okay? Now, if it takes the article, the article is always going to be the masculine article. So it's going to be ha, tu, to, tan. Okay? So it's going to be ha prophetes, tu prophetu, to prophete, tan prophetain. Tois prophetice, all right? I own Isaac's prophetice, all right? But it's going to take the, the masculine article, even though it's being defined here. It's a masculine noun of the first declension, okay? The other one is ha mathetes. Okay? And this means disciple. We get the, the English name Matthew from this, Mathetes. Ma Matthew means disciple. So these are two masculine nouns in the first declension. There are, there are some other examples that we'll add to our vocab later. The only way you would know is just learning the vocab. Prophetes, mathetes, masculine nouns in the first declension. Okay. Um, see if there's anything else I want to mention. Other than that, we can start working on the exercises. So um, I'd like to try to take the Greek and let's let's move them into the English, all right? So let's get started with um, example number one. Oi, mathetai, tone, Prophetone. Menusin. In. Co. Okay. All right, so kind of giving you some of my tips. You don't have to take this, but if I'm, I'm coming to this, I'm going to start to translate it, you know, whether on my paper or otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to split off a prepositional phrase that I recognize in to cosmo. All right, so we're going to translate this, but this just kind of gets this out of my, you know, lets me identify that as a prepositional phrase. Nothing else is jumping off the page to me as a preposition, okay? So what is our verb? Let's start with our verb here and and go from there. Menusi, okay? Menusin. What do you know? What What's the vocab? This is probably the ending, and what do we know about this ending? Usi. So what, what is that? Yep, third person, plural. Okay, so it's going to be they or whatever. So with that, with that given, what do we know men, meno? 
from a vocab means to, I believe, remain or abide. Um, yep, I remain. I remain. Okay? So we have they remain or they are remaining. Now, do we, we, we notice this, right? So I believe we have our... Subject, okay? Who remains? Okay. You look puzzled. <laughs> so we have remain, or are remaining is our verb. Now we want to look for who remains, who is remaining. So we're looking for a noun in the nominative case. And we notice... That is the plural. It's a plural noun. We know that because this is plural. The verb is plural. And we notice that this is nominative plural. And it goes with this. Now, this is a masculine noun of the first declension that we just learned. So we have the masculine article, but we've got the feminine ending here. But this is in the nominative case. Okay? So that's going to be our subject. And it means the... Mathetes, disciples. So who's remaining? The disciples are remaining. Okay, But we have this phrase right here. What do we know? What can you tell me right off the bat about that ending? What is it? Genitive, plural. Genitive, plural. Okay, Tone is a giveaway because it's the same you know, across the board. Masculine, this tone is going to be the, the giveaway for genitive plural. But So, the disciples, genitive plural, means of the prophets. Genitive plural. Of the prophets. Okay, so remain. So the disciples of the prophets remain or are remaining. And then what do we see here? Our prepositional phrase telling us where they are remaining. And it is in with the dative. What does in with the dative mean? What's our vocab? In. So they remain in. And then we see our object is in the dative case. Is it singular dative or plural? Singular. Okay, correct. So they remain in the cosmo. What is cosmos? What's our vocab? In the world. The disciples of the prophets are remaining in the world, or remain in the world. Ta-da! <laughs> sure, sure, but this is hopefully stretching our brains a little bit. Okay? So, let's uh, take number two there. Take two. Where they threw in the masculine nouns of the first declension. Right off the bat, this is like baptism by fire. <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks off, so everybody's a little rusty, huh? Rusty, rusty, rusty. All right, so here we go. We're going to throw in some adjectives, it looks like. So adjectives are, can be in, in two positions, the attributive position and the predicate position. Remember? Okay, what is the attributive position? Okay, the, uh, the, yeah, the article becomes, comes immediately before the adjective, right? Um, the predicate position, uh, there is, you know, does not, be, the article is not before. But here we go, ready? Oi, kakoi, 
Valusin. Litho, lithus, ace, tan, oikon, tone, mafe tone. All right, so let's take a look at this, okay? Now, as I come into this sentence, I, I recognize a prepositional phrase. Do you guys represent, what, what prepositional phrase do you recognize, Martha? Okay, ace, is it ace with the accusative, correct, right? Ace with the accusative, yep. Yeah. And then I also recognize this as being genitive plural, correct? So describing oikon, so therefore I'm going to, I'm actually, all of that is included in that phrase, all right, because this adjective is describing the noun that is the object of the preposition. So I just put parentheses around it so that way I know that my subject, my verb, the main components of my sentence are not coming from here. This is my prepositional phrase. I'm going to work with that later but I'm not going to pull my subject, my verb, my direct object from this prepositional phrase, okay? You can work at this anyways, but this helps you. We recognize a preposition, and then we can also recognize that this is describing that, all right? So with that being said, what's our verb here? What would be our verb, David? <laughs> that one shows action. Okay, yep. Do you recognize the verb ending? O ace a amen ete usi. Do you recognize any of those endings? <laughs> yeah. Start there. Okay. Martha, do you, you recognize it? Right? We have the usi. Now remember, this new is a movable new that they put in there sometimes for it's a phonetic rule. All right. Belusin lithus. Okay. They don't like the E L sound coming right on the heels of each other. So they put the movable new in. All right. So usi. Omicron, Upsilon, Sigma, Iota. Delta looks like a D. Mm -hmm. And Sigma, remember, Sigma in the middle of the world, word is kind of like an O with a baseball cap. But sigma at the end of the, wor end of the word looks like our English S a little bit. Okay. So this is sigma in the middle of the word. So. Usi, yep. So, all right. And then balo is one of our new definitions that I gave last uh, week included here. means to throw or to cast. Okay, so... Balo would be I throw or I cast. Balusin would be they, third person, plural. So if you want to kind of mark this over here, we've got third person, plural verb, okay? Now, in this case, do we have a nominative case 
present in our in, um, present in our sentence. Yes, we do. Now, it's a little bit of a unique, I say unique, but a little bit of different situation because what we have is we have the nominative oi and kakoi, but kakoi is a an adjective. This is one of those cases where they're using the adjective as a noun. And it means the, and then I think, David, you had it already. All right. The bad, is it masculine or general? Masculine. So this would be the bad men or the evil men. Okay. Men is understood here because this is uh, masculine. If it was kakai, it would be evil women because it's feminine. Um, in this case, the understanding is, is that this is something that a person does. So the evil men, like, like you couple that with the idea of throwing or casting, you know, uh, objects can't, a house can't throw, a dog really can't throw, or a horse or throw, you know what I mean? So we see... There's like an understood element here that this is only a, a person could do this. This is a cognitive action, something that is done with willful decision that actually takes human. You know, in this case, to say concrete, I would say, you know, yeah, this is pretty close to concrete because this is masculine, plural, the evil men you know so yeah I would say uh, me personally I would say it would be concrete in other words the, uh, the meaning is there if we were to translate this we would probably put the men in there okay now in your King James Bible they would probably put it in italics but that doesn't mean that it's not supposed to be there yeah so that's why I'm trying to tell you, like, it concrete is yes, because the meaning is there. The fact that they don't have they don't have to put the word, actual word in there, does not mean that the meaning is not to be understood there, okay? Um, it is to be understood. This is the, the is talking about people. And in particular, he's talking about men. He might he might be talking about evil people. Because they also, like the English, will refer to everybody as like mankind. Why is it mankind? When I say mankind, am I including women? Yes. I'm, I, you know what I mean? Because I'm saying mankind. And the Greek does that same way. We would say evil men. But the, you, you know, the understanding here is, is, you know, evil people. Even when we say evil men we kind of are, are understanding like, yes, man, but also mankind. And sometimes the context there will tell you if it's talking about specific men, evil men, or if he's talking about the fact that, you know, this is characteristic of all of mankind, you know. But, but the meaning is there. So, so that's why it's not an incorrect translation to actually put this in. Now, could we, if it made sense in English, could we say the bad, in this case, I would say we would put it in there because we don't use bad as a standalone noun, okay? We might say the faithful, you know, but we don't say the bad because in our language, like you were saying, it's too nebulous. The bad what? The bad dog? The bad, you know, because we think of bad being something maybe that could be, you know, the bad food, <laughs> Or, or whatever it might be. Um, so that's why we, if we were translating this in our, into English, we can't, the, we, we, you know, the English wouldn't understand this as the bad. So we'd either have to say the bad men. We could say the evil because when we say evil, there's enough inference or implication there to understand that this is human you know, because evil is, is, is a word that denotes will, decision. You follow what I'm saying? The human components. The animals don't have a, like a will. They, they operate 
under instinct. They, they're trained a certain way, you know, but we don't, we don't expect those animals to make good choices or bad choices, all right? So, again, all this is kind of like meaning and understanding, you know, but also words, and words matter, and so I would say that those words should be there, okay? So, we would say the bad men are casting or are throwing lithus we have the plural accusative from lithos what is lithos Lithos means stone, okay? There's no definitive article here, so just not these stones, but just stones, all right? So the bad men are casting stones, and then we have ace, ton, oikon, tone, mafe tone. So ace with the accusative means into... Tan oikon is it is accusative? Is it singular or plural? It's accusative singular. What's our vocab? Oikon. What's oikon? House, right? Into the house, and then we have our genitive plural. That giveaway tone. Okay, genitive plural, mafe tone. So of. The, and again, genitive plural, disciples. So, the bad men are casting stones into the house of the disciples. Mm -hmm. Stretching our brains. So, you're getting a little rusty. I saw you guys on Thursday night. You guys were showing off and writing on the the, the, the dry erase board downstairs, and everybody was like, "Ooh, look at how smart they are!" Woo! And, <laughs> and so I was like, "Lord, humble them." <laughs> Only so that you might be given grace. <laughs> Humiliate them so that they might. All right, let's let's do um, let's do number five here. We'll skip down to number five and see. Got a little shorter one. Hafeas Irene. Sorry, not ever a guy. Get this correct here. A gabre tus net cruise. Ek Thanatu. All right. Do we recognize any prepositional phrases? Ek. Ek Thanatu. So we're just going to, we're going to branch that out so we don't, uh, Get confused, okay? Um, let's start off with our verb, agere. O ace a agere is third person singular. 
What's the vocab? Egyro means to raise up or raises. All right, and then is that, what's our subject then? Who's, who's doing the raising? What's our nominative case noun here? God. Yep, and we, we wouldn't say the God. We would just say God. Because, let's see, you know, it's understood that this is God. The God is God. God raises up. Who does he raise up? Accusative. We have accusative plural, right? Third person, uh, we have accusative plural, tus, necrus. So he raises up, all right, the dead, okay? And we could say the dead men, but in this case, we, we understand this to be, we can say the dead. We understand what it's saying. and So we would just say God raises up the dead, and then ek thanatu. What is ek with the genitive? Out of. Okay. And what's this? Thanatos. What's that? We gotta learn our vocab too. We gotta keep working on our vocab. Thanatos is what? Ha thanatos? That. Okay. So, God raises up the dead out of death. All right. Something that is nice in our exercises is that now that we have more vocab and now that we have prepositional phrases and so forth, um, our sentences will start to make more and more sense. And that, that is nice. I'm not, I'm not saying that we won't have anything in the exercises that's off the wall, but when we started earlier, you know, we were working with limited vocab and so forth, and so we were only, you know, we had some kind of strange sentences. You're like, ah, what do those have to do with anything, all right? But now, as we're getting more and more vocab and we're getting the prepositional phrases and relational uh, relationships within the grammar and the words and the sentences, Something that's nice is context is going to matter, and, and, and the exercises and the sentences that we're going to be dealing with are going to be making more sense. And that's going to lead you to, you know, okay, you know, I think I know what this is, but let me, you know, quicker understanding, you know, thana, thana to death, of death, out of, out of death. So, okay, so, all right. Um, how about one more, one, and then we'll take a break. You've got a lot of exercise. Let's go, let's go English to Greek. Scrub, get this board clean. All right, um, let's go English to Greek here. Um, um, let's do number six. Through the voice of the prophet, the Lord is teaching the disciples. Okay, through the voice of the prophet. Now, Whenever we can, and, and this is one of the things I like about our authorized version of the Bible, is that it was a word-for-word -word formal translation. In other words, they kept the, the, the words, if it was a noun in Greek, they tried to keep it a noun in, in English. Now, that may be like, well, isn't that a given? For the majority of words, yes. But there are times when there's participles that are, that are hard to translate, uh, phrases and so forth. But for the most part, what you have in, a, in the authorized version of the Bible is a formal equivalent translation, all right? And along with that, if they could keep the word order in the, in the same way as it was in the Greek, they would. In other words, as, as long as it was understandable in English, 
they would keep the word order the same, even if we don't generally talk that way. Um, if we could understand it in English, th then they would keep it that way. So I say that to say as we come to this, we may not always, you know, through the voice of the Lord, uh, through the voice of the prophet, the Lord is teaching the disciples. We may, they may not be the the most frequent way we would say that. We would probably say the Lord is teaching the disciples through the voice of the prophet. That's probably generally how we would talk in English today. But what we try to do and what I love about the authorized version is, is that it kept the word order the same. We can understand this. In English, it's, it is proper grammar, even though we don't talk like this all the time. And this is what I'm trying to get at, and I'm not being very uh, <laughs> clear on it, but what I'm trying to say is, is that what matters to me is what did God say and the order that God said it in, because there's some importance and there's some significance. That to me is more important than how would we say this today? Everybody understand? So these modern Bibles, these modern translations of the uh, 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 into the English uh, uh, language, you know, they think, well, it's, you know, it's more important to update this, the Bible, into the language of today so that people can understand. Like, look, it is understandable that way. Sure, it's harder, you know, we don't generally talk this way, but it is, we do understand it, and it is grammatically correct in our language now. Give it to me the way that God gave it. You understand? and the accuracy of it. They were very careful. They were very uh, honest in their translation technique. So through the voice of the Lord, let's, let's keep this uh, in the same order. So what is, what is through, what preposition did we learn? Huh? Dia with the genitive, all right? Dia with the genitive. So we're going to have dia. and then it's going to take the genitive, so the voice, the voice. What is the word for voice? What's our vocab for voice? I believe it's um, phone. Okay, phone. And uh, so this is first declension, singular genitive. So what's our article and not all at once. Genitive singular. Case. Phonase. This is the genitive. Dia with the genitive. It's genitive singular, the voice. Phone is, hey, phone is our vocab word for voice. So genitive singular is going to be a ace. ace. So dia, tase, phonase. Through the voice, now you'll notice we have a in English it's a prepositional phrase, but this is a possessive showing possession, all right? So what do we what are we going to have immediately following phonase? It's going to be a genitive. going to be singular, right? Singular genitive. What do we know about prophet? Prophetes. Is it masculine? Yeah, masculine noun. So, to, to, and then remember, genitive singular, it's going to be prophet to.
Okay. So whose voice? The prophet's voice. The voice of the prophet. So dia tes phones to prophet here. Through the voice of the prophet. And then we have our subject. What's our vocab for Lord? Curios. Nama two cases, the subject. The Lord is the one doing the action here in the verb, which is teaching. So the Lord, ha curios. And what is teach? From Didasco, which is I teach, it's going to be third person singular because it's talking about the Lord. So third person singular, which is O Ace A. Didaske. The Lord is teaching. And then we have the disciples. So this is a direct object, which means it's going to be in what case? Accusative case. What is our vocab? For disciples, mathe, mathe taste, right? So we're going to have accusative, plural, mathe taste. Now, this is a, is it a masculine or is it masculine or feminine? It's a masculine noun, the first declension. So because it's a masculine noun, we're going to have the masculine accusative plural ending. And then, no, 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 sorry. I own ice, ass. Feminine, accusative, plural. Well, I say a feminine, but first declension, accusative, plural. So it's actually a masculine noun in the first declension, which first declension nouns primarily are feminine. But this is a masculine noun, but it does take the first declension endings except for first person genitive. Or sorry, it's not first person. Genitive singular. It is, so we use the first declension, not the second declension ending. Accusative plural. It's a masculine noun in the first declension. It's not feminine. It's masculine. That's the, the noun is masculine. It's a, it takes a feminine ending except for one. Yeah, the genitive singular. And it always because it's masculine, it takes its adjectives in the masculine form and the article. So that's why we're using the masculine article. Yeah, yeah. There's this is an exception, definitely an exception. Prophetes and mathetes are masculine nouns that are in the first declension. So we have the masculine article, accusative plural, tus. But we have the mathe tas, first declension endings, which are generally feminine endings, but first declension because this is a masculine noun. 
so we'll just call it first declension instead of second ending because we always say first declension ending. <laughs> so, all right. Let's uh, let our brains relax, and we'll come back and dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <laughs> I did not pray for humility. I did not pray and ask the Lord to humble you guys. <laughs> I was just teasing. Yeah. Plus, we you're out. We're you know we've had a two weeks off and we had a Resurrection Sunday in between and. It was a lot of fun and a lot of work and a lot of activity going on, but it also
teaching. 1 Corinthians is, chapter 2 is one of my favorite chapters in uh, the scriptures. I believe it'll be a, a blessing to you. Again, we oftentimes uh, you know, love the chapter divisions, love the, the verse divisions and so forth. And so I'm not... Um, against those as I make these comments. But sometimes I think in our brains, because of the chapter divisions, we, we like to compartmentalize and we lose the context sometimes. In other words, because of the chapter division, we don't associate chapter two with chapter one. Whereas, you know, this was a letter that was written to the church. It didn't come in chapters it didn't come in verses okay now again i am all for the chapters and the verses i i love it I, it helps us to be able to find the passage and the references and great great benefits to having it so i'm not one of these guys like oh yeah you know i want a bible without chapters and references because that's what the lord says to me i'm not that but we all we do have to be careful like that we don't just like rip chapter two out from chapter one. It, they, they, they're, it's building on what was said in chapter one. So at the end of chapter one, he's talking about the fact that God has ordained the church to operate in this manner, that that the power of God was going to be seen through the preaching of the cross. OK, now previous to this. You know, God had given wisdom to the Greeks, to the Gentile world. He had revealed light to them through knowledge and through wisdom, through creation and so forth. Um, but to the Jews in particular, God had given them uh, revelation. But that revelation, uh, in order to prove that it was from God, that the message was from God, that the words were from God, those uh, uh, revelations or those prophecies were accompanied with miraculous signs okay and the jews were told you know that that was their special uh benefit if you want to call it that that god had given to the jewish nation so that they might know that a message was from god it was to be accompanied with you know a miraculous wonder or a sign but now god is teaching he's saying hey look god is the the wisdom and the power of god Okay, you see how Gentile and Jew alike are now being combined. It says the wisdom and the power of God are now currently going to be revealed through the preaching of the cross. Chapter 1. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Everybody see that? That's what he said. All right. No flesh is going to glory in his presence. Uh, it's just going to be a message that's delivered and people are going to have to believe it. All right, the, the convicting of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the gospel is a powerful thing. It's a miraculous thing. It's a wonderful thing, right? We hear that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried, he rose again. We believe it. And there's a life-changing uh, occurrence, that ex uh, experience in our heart. And the power of God and the wisdom of God uh, in, in, in making a new creature. Now, all of this... The Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is going to teach the Corinthian church. These are all very familiar uh, passages. If you've been saved very long, you know if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Guess who that was written to? That was written to the Corinthians. All right. So he, the Apostle is going to explain all of this to him. He's going to show him like, hey, there's nothing short of a miracle that occurs in the heart of a man who believes the gospel. But right now he's laying that foundation. He's reminding these Corinthians that when I came there, I did not come with miracles. I didn't come with eloquence. I didn't come with logic. I didn't come with arguments that, that amazed Socrates and Plato. And if you were to put a, you know, Mount Rushmore of philosophers up, you know, it would, it would be those guys and the, and, and the Apostle Paul. <laughs> You know, no, he says, look, I came to you in weakness. I came uh, to you with just a message. I just preached. I preached Christ crucified. And you know what? The, the, the Greeks were not impressed. They thought it was foolishness. The Jews refused to believe it because there was no signs. There were no miracles. Now, Paul could do miracles. 
Okay, he had apostolic sign gifts that were given to him, um, and and he would use those as the Holy Spirit would allow him to, and so forth. But when he came to this particular church, he said, "You know what? I am going to preach Christ crucified. I'm not even going to get involved in baptism that much." This is chapter one. I'm reviewing. And Paul's just saying, "Look, I didn't hardly even baptize any of you because I." was determined that I was going to preach the gospel, that this church was going to be founded on the power of the preaching of the cross of Jesus. Now, with that being said, we move to chapter 2, and Paul begins to show them how they can know that a message is from God, how this works, how does God uh, do this mighty work of salvation through the preaching of a message that is unimpressive to the to the Gentile world and that is not accompanied with miraculous signs which the Jews required. And so he's going to lay that out in chapter number two, all right? The ministry we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about both the ministry and the manifestation of divine truth divine truth in this chapter, okay? Uh, how it works and how can we identify that this is a work of God. So we begin here by talking about the ministry of divine truth in the first uh, nine verses, uh, first eight verses of chapter two. In verse one, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice, if you would, the manner of the ministry, the manner of this ministry. Paul conducted his ministry much differently than many men do today. All right? Men want to be thought of as, you know, gifted. They want to be... Uh, eloquent, they want to be funny, they want to impress people with their speech and their style. But Paul says that when he came in the ministry of divine truth, when he came with a message of truth, um, he came in a different manner than what you might expect. We see here in verse number one the deficiency of the manner. He says, first of all, I came not with excellency of speech. All right? Uh, Paul did not come with the best of the best in eloquence. He did not come uh, with the, the most giftedness uh, that men. And by the way, men are gifted in eloquence. There were certain men in the Bible, Apollos, uh, whom the Corinthian church was very familiar with, was a very eloquent man. There were others who spoke very powerfully. And there are till, still today. There's nothing wrong with eloquence. There's nothing wrong with being spiritually gifted. Uh, throughout the church age, uh, 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 God has sent gifted men in this area. Charles Spurgeon was a very powerful man with words, all right? Um, uh, it, it, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, wow, man, that guy can say something. He can say it powerfully. He can say it eloquently. He can say it in a way that it's easy to listen to. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but there is something wrong if we begin to depend on that. There's something wrong with uh, people who determine the truthfulness of the message based on the eloquence of the speaker. Are you with me? All right. And so there are people who are like, well, I want to listen to this guy because he's easy to listen to. What's the content <laughs> of what he's saying? Uh, just because uh, he sounds good doesn't mean that he's speaking the truth. All right. Now, Paul was reminding the Corinthian church, and he's saying, look, when I came, I just preached a very simple message. I came not with excellency of words, um, I did not come with excellency of wisdom. All right? Uh, it wasn't the most logical thing. It didn't make the most sense. All right? Now, by the way, you know, the wisdom of God is very wise, and we know that. But to, to mankind, 
It didn't make a whole lot of sense to them, all right? Um, the wisdom of the Greeks thought this was foolishness. And uh, so that, that's the deficiency of the manner. But then notice the declaration of the manner. He says, when I came, I didn't come with this, but what did he do? What did he come with? He said, declaring, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And listen, I, I, I tell you what, you know, when I think of Corinthians and my understanding of this book grown up for years and years, and again, I appreciate the teaching that I got, but people just, you know, and this was me, when I came to Corinthians, it was like, oh man, this is a carnal church. Man, when I read free, First Corinthians, all, you know, you know, immediately what comes to mind were all the problems that this church was having and Paul correcting the problems. And I think of this more of a practical book. I'm not saying that it's not practical. Paul's going to apply all of these principles to their everyday life, to everyday church life, and to all the problems that they were having in their church. Uh, but if you're not careful, what I missed for years and years and years was just the powerfulness and, uh, of what Paul is saying here and the, and the truth, and dare I say, even dispensational truth that is contained in this that, that is applicable today. And so when you come to Corinthians, and if you're just thinking, oh, yeah, that's that book of that church, man, they had fornication, and they, had, they were taking each other to law, and, they, and they, they were, you know, speaking in tongues, and they were all carried away with this craziness. And Paul just wrote that book to just straighten them all out about those different topics. You're going to miss what Paul, you know, what he's really saying here, which, by the way, if we can gain, then we can get the answers to all of the problems in the church and the practical, if you would, the pragmatic. Are you with me? We can get to the pragmatic, but 1 Corinthians is a doctrinal book, and it's exciting to me, and this is why I'm, I'm diving into this. And what I'm trying to say is that at the end of verse number 1, Paul says, look, here's my philosophy of ministry. I'm not going to come and wow you with pretty sermons. I'm not going to come and wow you with my knowledge and with my, ooh, he knows uh, biblical languages and he's given us little tidbits that we didn't know. Paul said, I came declaring a message. I came saying, thus saith the Lord. I'm declaring to you the testimony of God. Now, that's powerful if you think about it. All right, I'm getting excited about it because this is what Paul said. He said, I'm telling you, here's a message from the Lord. Jesus Christ died on that cross for your sin. He shed his blood to pay the penalty that you deserve. And he was buried and he rose again. And if you believe him and put your faith and trust in him, he'll save your soul from a sinner's hell. That's what Paul said. Now, hey, look, people get all messed up today. They want flowery speeches. They want beautiful music. They want somebody to strum on a guitar and make them cry. And they don't want somebody to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. They want somebody to say, Well, in the Greek, it really means this and this. And did you know this? And you know this? And, well, we don't really under know what this, if this verse should even be in the Bible. Are you with me? Now, I'm not, I, you know, they say it much more eloquently. They get up there and they sound, they, you know, it's very flowery and they give you nuggets and this and this and this. But in the end, you come away and not, not with the power of God, not with a declaration. That's what I like about a declaration. <laughs> All right? All right? There's no him hawing We don't really know what this means. And you notice what he says there, what he was declaring. He was declaring the testimony of God. This is powerful stuff. When you think about the word of God, what Paul is saying, Paul's saying is, hey, look, I'm coming to you with what God says. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. This isn't the word of man. This isn't filled with a bunch of scribal errors. Uh, I'm not coming to you with the testimony that uh, has been passed down through generations that, that man has defiled and corrupted and added to and taken away from. No, he stood up there and said, I've got a message from God, the testimony of God. Whoa, Paul, have you said thus no? That's arrogant. How dare you? No, it's authoritative. It's authoritative. By the way, as we get into this, you better know that what you got is from God. 
Amen? And you believe that you've got something that's been tainted, then you're not going to stand up in the Sunday school class or if, if you're a man and you're going to preach or pastor or teach or whatever it might be, and if you think you've got something tainted, you're not going to stand up here and say, thus saith the Lord. You're going to get up there and you're going to think, well, we more likely than not, this is what God meant. Come on, man. What kind of teaching is that going to produce, right? And, and so Paul here is saying, look, man, I came and I did. I didn't have, I, there was deficiencies <laughs> in my wisdom. There was deficiencies in my words. But man, did I declare to you what God has to say. Amen? And so that's the manner of by which Paul went about his ministry and ministering the truth, the truth, all right? Notice in verse 2 then Paul's motive. We see the motive for the ministry. He gives us some insight behind why he chose this. He says there, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I like what Paul says here. He says, I determined. This was not something that Paul stumbled upon. He was like, <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing, and I accidentally found a, a, a method that really works, and, and conversions are way up. <laughs> and so, you know, you guys really should consider doing it this way because, you know, you'll get a lot of numbers in your church. Paul said, no. This didn't happen accidentally. I determined. There was a decision behind his motive. There was something that was deliberate in his method of ministry. All right? He made a, de a decision when he came here. All right? Paul had decided before he'd come to Corinth that his ministry would be singular in nature. He says, uh, not to know anything among you. This does not mean that Paul would refrain from being a busybody, but that the only thing he needs to know for his ministry in Corinth is the gospel. Now, this is coming right on the heels of Paul, you know, having debated with the Epicureans and the Stoics at, at Athens, all right? He had just been there immediately preceding his trip to Corinth. He had hobnobbed with the philosophers. He had tried to persuade through debate and through reason and through uh, wisdom, if you would. And, and Paul was no slouch when it came to this. He was a very educated man. Uh, he, was, he was gifted in, in philosophy. He was, he, yeah, and, and we see that throughout his epistles. I mean, he quotes poets. He quotes um, different uh, statesmen of, of the day and so forth. Paul was no country bumpkin, not that there's anything wrong with a country bumpkin, but he wasn't. As he stated to the Philippians, he was a very zealous, religious, educated, gifted, from every human type of, of standpoint, Paul could have tried to go that route and done that method, but he didn't. He said, I determined that I was going to just preach the gospel. I was just going to preach Christ and him crucified. He says, I not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, you can talk a lot about Jesus and avoid the cross. You know that? If you're not careful, go into the world and just try per to persuade Jesus. Man, he did a lot of miracles. And he did. He spoke a lot of parables. And, and he did. But Paul, when he came to Corinth, he wasn't focused on the teachings of Jesus. He wasn't focused on so much the miracles of Jesus. He wasn't focused on uh, how good Jesus was and how palatable Jesus is uh, to society. Paul was not running these PR campaigns. He gets us trying to make Jesus, you know, seem like the, the most uh, compassionate and caring. Jesus is all of that, but he doesn't need all of us to run around and be his PR agents. He needs us to preach a gospel. Christ died. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We're not going to skip over uh, the most important message about Jesus, and that is, is that He died on the cross for our sins. 
In verses 3 through 5, we see the might behind the ministry. Paul came with a simple message, delivering it in a simple way. But boy, did it have power. And the Corinthian church knew it. They were the product of it. They had, they had been saved under his ministry. Okay? He had come. They knew that he hadn't been very eloquent. They knew how weak he had been. They knew how little he relied on human giftedness and talent. Because they had been converted under his ministry as he preached the gospel to them. All right? He was in, he goes, I, he reminds them in verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. The character of Paul's performance in Corinth showed the need for divine power to help him minister. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. No one can serve God well without the power of God. I would say no one can serve, the, uh, serve God at all without the power of God. All right. Um, he says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. And so what we see here is, is that God's word is accompanied with his Holy Spirit and with the power of God. And the gospel is empowered by the Spirit of God and by the gospel of God. And there is a real demonstration of power that comes from that. That is the life-giving and the life-changing power. Why did Paul do all of this? He says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God, the power of God. You know, today, even in churches, pastors dealing with Christians, not even talking about winning the lost. Winning the lost, we need to give them the gospel, and we need to preach the gospel. It means simple. It's not fancy. It doesn't make us look like geniuses, <laughs> but that's what they need. But take this inside the church. Pastors today in churches, they want something new. They want something revolutionary. They want the preacher to come up with new explanations or new ideas to try to help them through life. And what you need is not something new, not something you know magical, not something that's based on human talent. What we need today is we need the words of God preached, the Holy Spirit, through His presence and the power of God that's present what the believers need is what the lost need it's 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 we don't need to hear people speaking in tongues we don't need people having visions of 40 feet 40 foot jesus um we don't need these things we need the presence and the power of god all right and by the way you can have that with just the preaching of the word of god okay you don't you know you don't need a fog machine you don't need a, a band. When you have a band, it's nice to play. But if the band can't show up, that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's not going to be there that day. If the fog machine breaks, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't going to be present all right, in church anymore. All right, It's a shame, but that's how it is. Let's look at uh, the message here more specifically in verses 6 through 8. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, talking about mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's interesting here that Paul talks about the fact that the world, the wisdom of this world, uh, nor the princes of this world knew this wisdom. What wisdom? The gospel. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the preaching of the cross. 
Jesus Christ crucified. Paul says that it was a mystery. Um, it was a mystery. It was hidden. It was hidden in the Old Testament. Um, it was hidden from the wisdom of the world, and it was hidden from the princes of this world. Now, this is not talking about individuals. It's not talking about people. All right, you look and you study this throughout the Bible. It's talking about spiritual beings who have knowledge and wisdom, and they impart that to men, particularly, you know, in order to take men away from God, in order to get men infatuated with their knowledge and their technology and their abilities and not to be enamored with the message from God the life-saving message from God. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest hindrances that to the gospel today is the cell phone. It's, the, it's all this knowledge that where did it come from? It, it just seems like it's too incomprehensible to even understand all of this stuff. And, and, I, and I personally believe that this was knowledge that was imparted to man, okay? Probably more than likely from the princes of this world. But here's what Paul said that they didn't know. They didn't know that Jesus Christ dying on that cross was going to produce the victory. They didn't know that the power and wisdom of God uh, would be manifestly manifested in the church age through the gospel. They didn't know that because had they known that, they wouldn't have crucified him. All right? So we'll talk a little bit about that some more next week. But I think for now brains are full. So, anybody have any questions? I love 2 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Okay, it's giving me some good stuff, so. All right, well, we will next week, I believe we're going to be here, same time, same place, with all of your assignments done and correct. And Brother David won't be humbled. <laughs>